Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. Today we've got an interesting topic for everybody out there about where you can fly your drone. Specifically we'll be looking at the open categories as set out by the CAA. The A3, the A2 and the A1 subcategories. Additionally we'll be looking at the qualifications you need to fly in a particular subcategory. Once we've done that we'll be looking at the airspace restrictions and how they affect every flyer of a drone regardless of your qualification or the weight of your drone. So let's get into it. So first, I want to say that I've looked at the CAP722 document on the CAA website, and this is really the go-to document for finding all your information. If you get stuck on anything, fire that up on your browser, command F and type in what you're looking for, and hopefully that'll take you straight to the answer. It's definitely the place to go. But I've looked at this and summarized this as best I can, and I'll quote from them directly. So the first category and the place that most people are going to start out is the A3 subcategory. So that effectively is 150 meters away from residential, commercial and industrial areas. And with a minimum separation distance of 50 meters between the drone and uninvolved people. Now I'll read exactly what it says from the website. The subcategory is A3 fly far from people. This category covers more general types of unmanned aircraft operations. The unmanned aircraft may only be flown in areas where no uninvolved person may be endangered by the unmanned aircraft and may not be flown within 150 meters horizontally of areas that are used for residential, commercial and industrial or recreational purposes. So that rules out really playing fields. This is for drones that have a mass of more than 250 grams. And like I said earlier, you will need a flyer ID to be able to fly in this area. So what if you want to fly in built up areas? We'll need to go and do the A2 CFC. Let's look at what permissions you get first. So again, I'm going to read from the CAA CAP722. A2 subcategory is flying close to people. So under the transitional provisions, don't get me into that, but basically at the moment, operations in subcategory two can be conducted near to people within a minimum horizontal distance of 50 meters from uninvolved persons. The remote pilot must have successfully completed an additional competency examination, the A2 CFC, and the UAS must be a transitional UAS with a mass of less than two kilos, only until 1st of January, 2026. So the whole transitional period should have actually expired and we should now be having C labeled drones. But thanks to uh, Brexit, that now hasn't happened. Whereas the Mavic 3, a Mavic 3 Classic, would have been able to have the C1 class and could have flown in the A1 subcategory. Now we can't do that. Frustration for everybody. Okay, what if your drone's 250 grams? Where can you fly it then? A1 subcategory is the most lenient there is, which is kind of strange because the requirement for it actually is to have the operator ID on a drone that has a camera. And if your drone doesn't have a camera, you don't even need to do that. You don't even need a flyer ID. Makes no sense to me. But here we go, here, here are the rules. Again, reading from the CAA website, A1 to fly over people. Operations in the subcategory A1 can be conducted with, within congested areas, as defined in section 2.1.8, and may be carried out over uninvolved people, but not assemblies of people. Any overflight of people should be avoided if possible and kept to a minimum. Operations must be conducted with a UAS, less than 250 grams, that is privately built or placed on the market before 1st of January 2026. So this is under the leg legacy provisions. So there we go, if it's under 250 grams, you can fly in the A1 subcategory, and that is effectively in, from your back garden, not quite wherever you like, but from many, many places. Before you just switch to the next video, just remember that we need to talk about airspace as well, and that affects everybody. So this really, we're talking about the A1, A2, and A3 subcategories. This is really what's on the ground, not what's in the air that is important in these subcategories. And to look at the big picture, we also need to look at the airspace. 
and that will come to in a minute. There's a side note here, actually, that if you've got an under 500 gram drone, like the uh, DJI Avata, which I think is uh, it's about 480 grams, something like that, might be 475, then you, with the A2 CFC, you can also fly in the A1 subcategory. And I'll read from the CAA again. So the A1 transitional UAS with a mass of less than 500 grams, provided the remote pilot holds the A2 CFC certificate, does not overfly and involve people. So there we're looking at the same permissions apart from not overflying uninvolved people. If you want to know what uninvolved people are, then maybe I'll do a video on that. And if you want to not miss the video, hit the subscribe button. So there we go. We, we've looked at the subcategories and what you can and can't fly. So what does this mean as far as places to take off and land then? I mean, if you follow the, the rules, does it mean you can fly from, uh, let's say, a National Trust land or English Heritage or a footpath? Now, the National Trust has a policy of no drone flights allowed from their land. Probably their insurance provider looks at it like if a drone pilot makes an error and there has to be a claim on one of their sites, they're not going to try and claim from the drone pilot. They're going to try and claim from the landowner who's given permission. But what I'd say to you, if you're on a National Trust site and you see a sign that says no drones, then I would respect that. What about footpaths? Well, the clue is in the name, really. It's a footpath. Even though it may not be illegal to take off from there, it may not be legal either. And what I mean by that is if you happen to be flying and someone walks into your space where you're, you're flying or, or landing, let's say, like this person did. <laughs> you would be breaking the air navigation order. The air navigation order really is something that every, every aircraft has to take notice of, uh, but specifically Article 241. And what that says is, I'll put it on the screen, but basically what it says is you cannot recklessly endanger people or property. And if you're flying from a footpath and you've got so close that you're trying to land your drone when there's somebody walking down it, I would say, in my opinion, that you have broken the air navigation order. Now, people will have different views on this, but ultimately it's down to the court to decide. So if, if, a, if a case like that were to go to court, then they are the ones that will make the decision and they'll ask experts whether they've broken the law but I think any person with any sort of common sense would say yes they've broken the law because that is a dangerous thing to do so be responsible now I'd also say you need to be mindful of people's privacy and if I were to take off from my back garden my neighbors would be in shot and I'm sure they wouldn't be happy so I try and look at it like if someone was going to poke their camera above my fence would I be happy with that because that's effectively what it is so I wouldn't fly from there but if you speak to your neighbours, maybe they agree. Maybe explain what you're doing, but I'd rather fly somewhere else. So let's look at airspace restrictions and how you work out what airspace you can actually fly in. So airspace is something that every drone pilot, regardless of weight or drone size or qualification, has to look at. So you quite often see people who think that a sub 250 gram drone is exempt from certain airspaces. It's not. They apply to all drones from the lightest to the heaviest. Now, Altitude Angel recently launched a new app and uh, this is the layers that I have enabled on my app. It's up to you to decide which you want the big controlled airspaces around airports aren't relevant for drones, so I turn those off. I like to keep some danger areas and things on. We've got uh, military sites close by that it just helps me to remind myself, and also temporary restrictions is well worth having because things like NOTAMs, which are basically noticed to airmen or air people nowadays, um, but it's, it's worth having those on because you can see if there's a temporary flight restriction coming up for instance, for the King's coronation recently, there was big restrictions put in place, and at least you can see those coming. I also check Altitude Angel's Drone Assist app every time before I fly. So if you're planning to fly, always check. So something else you need to consider is whether you are in a military training zone. Now, the way to check this really is looking at the MOD website and seeing where their flying areas are. But if you are local to an area, chances are that you know 
that there are lots of military flights going on and in a tactical training area flights can be down too for instance i'm in a tactical training area for for helicopters and flights can be between surface and 250 feet that is in the area of which you'll be flying a drone potentially so obviously keeping your drone in sight is ultimately the best way to mitigate against any of these risks so i would recommend you do that and it's also a rule actually it's, it's the law you need to be able to see your drone and see its orientation nowadays if in altitude angel you see that you're in a flight restricted area it doesn't mean you can't fly it means you need to get the right permission to fly you can get that now there are some uh, airports and, and flight restricted zones you can apply for permission within the altitude angel app and there are some where you we give you contact details you can call them up ask them what the process is to get an unlock for your particular area now i did a video on this a couple of years ago about how to get permission to fly in a flight restricted zone the process is still the same altitude angel makes it a little bit more easy now i'll put a link to that in the description of the video so in summary you need to look at both the category the subcategory you're flying in which looks at the ground conditions and the additional layer of the airspace that is above that to work out where you can fly now you can't look at one or the other exclusively you need to look at both to work out where you're going to fly i hope that makes sense but if you can get your head around it then that's probably one of the biggest uh, obstacles really to working out exactly where you can fly what i would say is that there's no substitute for proper training YouTube videos are great. I would certainly recommend uh, channels like Geeks Varna who are up to date with the rules and they, they produce stuff pretty quickly when it comes out. So I know they did a tutorial on the Altitude Angel app, the new one, and they often have CAA people on there who discuss drone issues. So it's definitely worth a subscribe to the uh, Geeks Varna channel. But what I would say is that there's no substitute for actual training. Uh, and you can do at the moment, I'll put a link in the description to the free A2 CFC course that UAV Hub supply. You don't get to do the exam, you can pay for that in addition, but you can get to do the A2 CFC training, which will give you a great understanding of everything I've talked about. It's definitely worth doing, especially since it's free. So I'll put a link to that in the description. If you've enjoyed the video, it'd be great if you give it a thumbs up. And if you've enjoyed it that much, click the subscribe button i'd really appreciate that and if you've really really enjoyed that and you don't want to miss out click the bell icon too my aim is to be able to help you fly in more locations and more places thanks for watching i'll see you next time and if you found this video interesting maybe you'll find one of these interesting